Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it. It is being written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of covenants and talking more specifically about covenant conditions and promises and going through this exhaustively through the New Testament. So important to understand that you have come into covenant relationship and we are in the new covenant. The old covenant has been fulfilled and eliminated. The new covenant now is come into force. Jesus Christ is the one who has accomplished it and the law of Christ and all the commandments and sayings of Jesus are what you and I are to follow and obey in seeing the conditions be met in the covenant to see the promises coming to pass. Hebrews 8, 6, now he's obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. You and I are to possess the promises, but in possessing the promises, you have to meet the conditions because a covenant is not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. You have the responsibility to carry out the things that God has called you to do. We're going to pick up where we were. We've been in 1 Corinthians. Look at a couple scriptures that we looked at already. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. If any man is loving God, any man's loving God, the same has been known of him. If we see many scriptures where it uses if, and then if means that that part's going to be the condition that you and I must carry out. You meet the condition, then God will perform that. The one who is loving God, the same is known of him. He's only going to know those, remember, that are his. He's only going to know those who are walking in his ways, following the way after the word of God. Therefore, you and I must love him. And of course, how do you show you love him? Because you keep his commandments. You have his commandments and keep his sayings. Do all the things that he says. That's the evidence that you love him by the action of obedience upon the word of God. Now we see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here we see it's commonly reported commonly that there's fornication among you and such fornication as, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Well, that was terrible. It should never have been happening. He said, you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he have done this deed might be taken away from you. That means conditions needed to be met in order to see them do what was right. Be in a subjunctive mood verb, that they were necessary that they took him away, but they didn't do it. They were not dealing with things. That's a great mistake. One of the things we see in the church world today, churches are not dealing with things that need to be dealt with. They're just winking at the sin or kind of letting things pass, turning the eye of their head away from things. That's a mistake. You can't. Things cannot be and have sin in churches or even your life as well, or it's going to contaminate you. He said, I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. This is because he has violated covenant. And because of that, therefore, he's going to be delivered over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh because of disobedience. When you obey, you're blessed. When you disobey, curses come. Now it goes on and says that, in order that, the Spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now this doesn't mean he's going to be saved. This means that it's possible for him to be saved if conditions are met, be in the subjunctive mood. And who's the one who would save him? Because it's a passive voice, it means it would be the work of God because the subject which is talking about him can, is going to be saved by somebody else who is God because he would come to repentance by meeting the conditions of changing his ways and repenting and coming to the place of walking right. That is what is of a necessity. We see that their glory was not good. He says, note that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It contaminates the whole group. Well, sin will contaminate you just as well. We cannot have any sin. 
How are we going to see the promises come to pass if we have sin in the camp? It's not going to happen. Could they stand before their enemies when they had sin? No. Instead, the enemy was able to defeat them. You must conquer all sin. Remember, sin has no dominion over you any longer. So what does he say? He says, purge out, cleanse out, cleanse thoroughly. The old leaven. You've got to cleanse everything out. It's the same word used over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 where it talks about how we're to cleanse out all the things that are not of God in order to be a vessel of honor and to be sanctified. And notice he says that you may be, that is, if you do it. Why do we say that? We were bringing this out every time. The subjunctive mood in the Greek means a conditional statement, meaning if that conditions are met, then this will happen to be, happen, come to pass and to be ongoingly effective because it's a present tense. So what it's saying is that you may continually be ongoingly a new lump. Now when it says new, this isn't the word kinos, which is the word for brand new, something that never existed before. This is talking about something that has been restored back to being new and whole. It's a different word in the Greek, neos. And this word is referring to the fact that you get totally restored like you're brand new, like nothing ever happened. That's what God will do when He cleanses you. He'll cleanse you and He will forgive you and you will be as if things didn't happen if you have gotten yourself cleansed from, purged out from everything that is leavened, that is sin. As He said, you're unleavened. Well, they're unleavened in spirit, but they have been were contaminated, unfortunately. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. You and I must deal with things. He says in verse 9, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators. <coughs> this means to keep company with, to really be have fellowship with, to mix up together with. No, we're not to have anything to do with them. And he's talking about the fornicators of the world here. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous extortioners or idolaters, then must you have needs be go out of the world. Otherwise, a judgment would come upon you because you are violating the word of God. Sin brings death, remember. So he says, Now I've written unto you not to keep company, if any man be called a brother. This doesn't apply just to those people out there in the world. This applies to anybody that's a brother. If he's a fornicator, or a covetous, idolater, a railer, a drunkard, or an extortioner, or such a one you don't even eat. Why? Because you'll have a transfer of spirits by fellowship with someone. Evil companionships will corrupt good manners, the scripture says. There will be a transfer of spirits by fellowship with those who are unclean. You cannot be touching the unclean thing or it will be contaminating you. Well, he says, what have I to do to judge them also that are without? God judges the people that are without, talking about the people that aren't born from above. Do not you judge them that are within? That's right. The church is responsible to judge those who are within if they will not come to the place of repentance because they have a responsibility to make sure that everything is holy and unleavened and everything is right in the sight of the Lord for Him to be approving uh, those, that particular church or that particular person or whoever it might be or that household, whatever it might be. Them that are without, God judges. Yeah, he, he will. He, they aren't going to get away with anything. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person, meaning you have to judge from within. And they did not do it. They were in compromise. What a mistake. And we must do this because, he says, Dare any of you have a matter against the law, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Well, we, because the saints are the ones who are going to make the judgment on things. And he says, do you not know that the saints, the holy ones, that is, shall judge the world? Well, when's that going to happen? Well, that's the ones who are going to be there in the millennial reign in positions of authority. They're going to be judging the world. We're not judging the world now. Remember, God's judging those without. But when we come into the place of in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, ruling and reigning, we are. And who's the ones that are going to make it? Only the saints, the holy ones. They are going to judge the world. That is important to realize. And also further, look at the next one. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? There will come a time when we will be judging angels as well. You must come to the place where you judge what is right, what is wrong, and you, are, have, you understand 
that what you must take a stand for what is, what is correct and in line with the Word of God. You cannot be in compromise. That's a mistake. If you're compromising, are you going to be qualified to be judging the saints or judging the world in the millennial reign? Are you going to be qualified to be judging anything, the angels down the road? No. You've got to know the Word of God. You've got to know your authority. You've got to know what's right. You've got to take a stand, and you cannot be in compromise whatsoever. We see people that compromise all the time in things, compromise in relationships, compromise in homes, compromise in churches, compromise all over the place. It's a mistake. It'll cost you if you compromise. God's a covenant-keeping God. And remember, He's no respecter of persons. He's not just going to just, you know, let it pass. He didn't let this pass. Things have to be dealt with. No compromise in our lives. We do what is right. We're serving the Lord. We're following Him. That's what the stand you must always take. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Who are the unrighteous? People that aren't born again, but also people who are walking in unrighteousness. Remember in Luke chapter 13 where it talks about, in verse what, 27, of the one who was unrighteous, worker of some unrighteousness, he said, depart from me. They were cast out and thrust out. Otherwise, someone who's walking in sin is unrighteous. We cannot have unrighteousness in us. Notice, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is not talking about just unbelievers. This is anybody who's unrighteous in any aspect. Remember, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. All is going to be under that judgment. That's all because of covenant. God is a God who wants to bless everybody when they obey will, when we obey. But he's also going to bring forth judgment on those who do not. Here he says, be not deceived. And of course, he wants you to let you know that people, there are people that are teaching that all these kind of people, oh, they're still going to make it. They're still going to be saved. They're liars, according to the word of God. They're, they're teaching false things. They're trying to deceive the multitudes. Be not deceived. And when he says, be not deceived, this is a command to you and me. Ongoingly, don't let anybody deceive you about this. Anybody who's unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's covenant. It's all about covenant. Only the righteous are the ones who are going to come into the kingdom and rule and reign. So who are the ones that were not? It's not just the fact that you're not born again. Why? Because this is talking about all the people, what things they do. The fornicators, the idolaters, the adulterers, the effeminate, the abusers of themselves of mankind. This is a homosexual. The thieves, the covetous, the drunkards or the intoxicated ones, the revilers, the railers, the extortioners. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, suppose you had any of these aspects in your life any time. He says, such were some of you. He's saying, yeah, this is what you, some of you were, but... You did the right thing. What did they do? It says, and this is misleading, as you'll see in a moment, you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Well, it sounds like then God just did that whole thing for them. When it talks about the part about being sanctified, this is talking about God's work being accomplished because it's passive voice, meaning God did it to the, for the people. Same thing with justified. It's also passive voice, meaning that the subject, which is you and me, has been justified, declared righteous by God. But what about the first one? Did God do this one for them? No. They had to do it for themselves because it is a middle voice. The middle voice in the Greek is important when you see a verb that's in the middle voice because it means the subject is doing the action for his own benefit and the results in his own life, meaning that they washed for themselves. They got themselves washed. They did what was necessary to be washed. And that meant that they had to cleanse themselves of everything, turn away from it, confess their sin, repent, walk in the ways of the Word of God. And then, because of that, then they were sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. This again, is the same thing, and we just mentioned this, but we'll go back and just look at this for a moment. This is talking about unrighteousness, remember. 2 Timothy 2.19, 
Uh, when it says the Lord knows them that are his, and he says, let everyone that names the name of Christ, that would be someone who claims to be a Christian, depart, and this is the command that is given. He's saying to them, depart, imperative mood, from what? The word iniquity is the word adakia, which means unrighteousness. Depart from unrighteousness, of course. Why? Otherwise we can't enter into the kingdom of God as we saw. And then he talks about those who are a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. And then he says, if a man therefore purge himself, this is the same word, cleanse out and cleanse thoroughly from these, he'll be a vessel of honor. He's got to do it though, but it's conditional upon him doing it. And he's actively responsible to do it. God's not going to do it. We have to do what he says to see it be accomplished. And then what will we be? We'll be sanctified which again shows that we have been, the work will have been accomplished by God in the past, present results will have come to the place of being sanctified and holy before Him because we cleanse ourselves. That means it's, it's mandatory that you cleanse yourself from everything. That's all about covenant relationship. And you're able to do that. You just do what the Word says and God, of course, will forgive you. He will bring forth the, as you use your authority, you can ca cast all the demons. You can be set free from every bondage. In fact, another scripture that's important along this line is 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, which we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves. Same word, katharizo. Ourselves from what? All filthiness, every defilement of the flesh. Every fleshly work has to be eliminated and spirit, which is the evil spirits, the filthiness of the spirit or the unclean spirits, which are the evil spirits that we cast out. What will that do? That will perfect holiness in the fear of God. That's what you and I are to come to, being saints, the holy ones. It is mandatory that you and I go through the cleansing process. Now, one other scripture that we looked at the last time, but just want to drive this point home again. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 17. This is about the guy preaching the gospel. And if I do this thing willingly, otherwise you can't do things grudgingly or because I have to or ought to, you should do it willingly, you want to. I have a reward. You're going to be rewarded when you do things in obedience willingly. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Barely that when I preach the gospel willingly, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, meaning no money. I don't say, I'm going to give you this if you pay me such and such a money. That I abuse not my authority in the gospel. We do have authority in the gospel, but we cannot abuse it by charging money for it. This means any place, any person, any organization, any one of these uh, retreats they have or, or different conferences they have, anything that's charging money is sin. It is wrong. You cannot bring the gospel to someone having charged up front money. It is a sin. It is abusing the authority. And also, someone who would be referring people to someone who's going to charge money, they're just as guilty. <laughs> we know people that have done that. They're just as guilty. You can't be doing that. You can't be a party to it whatsoever. Chapter, verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. One receives the prize. So run that you might obtain. Well, you and I need to be running this race. And what's the race for? This is a command to you and me, imperative mood. It is a present tense, which means ongoing continuous action. So it literally says, be running continually. That means I need to be I can't just be, you know, loitering, loitering around just whenever I feel like it or if, it's, if it works out for me, you know. And no, you need to be running this race. This needs to be an aggressive, all-out pursuit in your life. Be running that you may obtain. And this is subjunctive mood, meaning conditional. Meaning, will I automatically obtain the prize that's for me? of the incorruptible crown, which is what it's talking about, you'll see in a moment. No, I have to be running so I might obtain that corruptible, incorruptible crown. Every man that strives for the mastery, 
And this striving for the mastery is also the word agonizomai, meaning to contend with adversaries. It is translated fight in 1 Corinthians 6.12, fighting the good fight of faith. So you and I are going to contend with adversaries. We're going to fight. We're going to strive to conquer and overcome anything, any adversary that would try to hinder us. What do we have to be? We've got to be temperate in all things. That means you're self-controlled. You're keeping control of the flesh. You're not letting the flesh dominate you or rule you or lead you or guide you or manifest in any way. You're crucify that flesh daily. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But what are we after? The incorruptible crown. The crown for those who are, have been victorious. The Stephanos crown of victory. I therefore so run, but we not as uncertainly. Uh, we know where we're headed. We're running to possess the promises and possess the incorruptible crown, the eternal life, everything that God has for us, to be found that the, we have fulfilled everything He says so that we can enter into the kingdom and be what God wants us to be in these coming, in the millennial reign. So fight I. That means I have to fight also. What am I doing? I'm fighting against the enemies. You've got to conquer all enemies. God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you are well able to conquer every work of the enemy in your life. You can cast out every devil, you can resist every mountain, you can conquer everything that would come against you. Not as one that beats the air, otherwise I know what I'm hitting, I'm hitting in the realm of the spirit, I'm smiting those enemies and they're being smitten. Now he comes to this and he says, important point, I keep under my body. I am buffeting this body. I am keeping this body under control so it does not run me or any operation through it because what's the body? It's a body of death, sins dwelling in it. And I bring it into subjection, which means I make my body a slave. It is my slave. A slave does what you tell it to do. It does not dictate to you what it's going to do. You order it and tell it what to do. Your body is to be your slave. You do not let your body run you. You are a brand new person on the inside. You have a new spirit, a new heart. You tell your body and you tell it what to do. Otherwise, you don't follow you know, the dictates, desires, lusts of the flesh, anything from the feelings contrary to the Word of God. No, you, you've got to make this your slave. Lest that by any means, when I preach to others, so I'm out there preaching to others, but I, I'm letting the flesh run me. I'm sinning left and right. Boy, you're in trouble. It's amazing, whether you're aware of this or not, how many pastors out there have either had to resign recently, or they've been fired recently, or they've been prosecuted all over the place, even large churches. <laughs> What's wrong with these guys? How in the world could they get into this kind of thing? Shows you they should have never been in the ministry to begin with. It's astounding. The, the, God's shaking everything, see? And everything's being exposed in these last days, and it has to be exposed. So he says, when I preach to others that I myself should be a castaway, not standing the test, not approved, I would be a reprobate and cast away. <laughs> we can't have that happen. We are running this race. We're going to fight. We're going to conquer. We're going to get the incorruptible crown. We're going to prevail and see the victory, and we're not about to let our body lead us down the wrong path. Remember, your body is adverse to your spirit. Your flesh is against it. You cannot give place to it whatsoever. Covenant relationship demands that you do what he says and possess the promises. If not, you'd be a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. And this is when it's talking about committing fornication. I mean, this is telling us, you know, a subjunctive mood. <laughs> may, may you never be committing fornication whatsoever. What happens? What happened when these guys have committed fornication? Twenty-three thousand died in one day. Fornication is sinning against your body. It's going to bring destruction. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. You tempt him, that's because you're not doing the word, you're resisting, you're not obeying 
you're doing contrary to the, what the Word says, and what's going to happen? You give place to the devil, the devil, the serpents are going to take you down and bring destruction. We cannot allow that. They tempted Christ even when they limited and limited him because they drew back and didn't do what he told them to do. Oh, no, you are to be obedient. Why wouldn't you be obedient? There's no reason why not to. We should just follow his way. We know it's the right way. We know it's the way that leads to eternal life, the narrow way, the way that brings victory. Why would we not even give place to anything other than following and being obedient to the word? Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. So we know fornication is bad, we know tempting Christ is get bad, but murmuring is also bad. You're going to get destroyed of the destroyer. You can't be murmuring. You can't allow these things to happen. If you're murmuring, you're commanded not to be murmuring. Because this is a command. Don't be murmuring about things. You just speak the word, pray the word, do the word, Give people what they have need of. Encourage them to do the right thing. Don't be murmuring, complaining, griping. Even at your job, you do it under the Lord. You don't get an attitude and all these kind of things and murmur and gripe. You'll be destroyed of the destroyer. That's giving place to the enemy. You're to be rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He says rejoice evermore. There's no room for murmuring if you're always rejoicing. And you're to keep your mind stayed on Him so you stay in peace. Do not let yourself be a murmur. Guard yourself. Otherwise, the destruction is coming your way, unfortunately. The destroyer will be able to get to you. These happens unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition, our warning, upon whom the ends of the age, this means, are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, oh, I think I'm okay, I can handle things, Take heed lest he might fall, otherwise it's possible that you could fall, subjunctive mood. You always got to be on guard. You always got to be watching and praying. You always got to be ready to resist any and all temptation. You always got to be taking it, be ready to take every thought captive. You got to be ready to not give place to any of those feelings and things that come from the flesh. You got to be on guard. Any of the evil spirits that you haven't gotten out of you yet that try to influence you and to deceive you and get you to do something or got to watch what you hear from the outside that's trying to get to you to bring false doctrine teachings into you, whatever it might be. Oh, we've got to always stay on guard and be doing what the Word says in every situation so we do not fall. Which means you got to be also judging yourself. It even says over here in 1 Corinthians 11, 31, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's just a covenant statement. You judge yourself and get things right, you won't be judged. You don't judge yourself and you don't have things right, you will be judged. That's just, it's all covenant. These are all covenant statements, if, showing that that's our responsibility. You and I must judge ourselves. If we don't judge ourselves, then, of course, we are going to be judged and we can't th think, wonder why Things have happened. Well, we, we didn't deal with things the way we should have. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25. And regarding the body of Christ, there should be no schism. There should be no division or dissension in the body. There shouldn't be. But why is there? Because of the fact that people are not coming in line with the Word of God doctrinally. They're not coming in line with the Word of God of doing what the Word says. And so that's why there's dissension and division that there should be, this really is, it's a subjunctive mood verb, again, meaning that it, there may, may, may not be, there should, may, they should but never be any schism if conditions were met, meaning that we're walking in line with the Word and we're doing the Word. In this case, it's saying that the members should have the same care one for another. Otherwise, we're reaching out to help minister to people's needs. That's what God wants. Otherwise, you can't be all about you. You got to be about serving as well. You're going you're to do what God wants you to do to possess all the promises, deal with yourself, of course, but you're also going to be a servant of others. Remember, the greatest is the servant of all. You want to be, if you're all about me, there's something wrong. If you really have 
the servant's heart, you'll be looking for ways and be ready always to minister to other people. That's what God wants. And you won't be, you'll be looking for ministering to people's needs. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels of not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And we're like nothing. Even if you have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if all faith, you could remove mountains, and if not love, you're nothing. We must operate in love at all times. Even if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if not charity, it profits me nothing. Without love, your faith won't work. Without love, nothing that you do is going to profit you whatsoever. You must always walk in love at all times. It is absolutely essential. Remember, those are the ones that are the real disciples, the ones that have love one to another. And only the real disciples are the ones that are going to be in the marriage. This is mandatory. Everything else you do will be nothing if you do not walk in love at all times towards every person. That is mandatory. We come to chapter 14, verse 1. Follow, and this is the word dioko, which means to run after. We run swiftly after something, running after, and charity is the word of God be for love. Be running after love, and this is a command to you and me, imperative. All these imperatives are all part of the covenant, you know. There's subjunctive mood ones that show the conditional statements. They're all our responsibility. There's if this, if that's all our responsibility, then he'll do this. And all the commands and all the sayings. Well, those are all things that you and I are to obey so we see God's blessings come upon us. This is all covenant. You are to be running after charity, love. And it also tells you to burn with zeal. This is a command to you and me. You should not shy away from wanting to operate in gifts of the Spirit. You should be desiring spiritual gifts, present tense, ongoingly, and this is a command to you and me. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you and He wants to manifest through you. That's part of you being a vessel of the Holy Spirit so He can speak through you whatever He wants to bring forth. Gift of prophecy, Speaking, ed ed exhortation, edification, comfort to people, encouraging people, speaking forth, and being a mouthpiece for God to speak. This is why you want to get filled up with the Holy Spirit and be ready to speak things that God would give you because everybody can prophesy, remember. It's all could prophesy. And he says, you're desired, but rather that you might prophesy, talking about the one particular gift. Otherwise, this gift is apparently available for everybody. Otherwise, it would not say this, that you all may prophesy, present tense, subjunctive mood, conditional, if you meet the conditions, of course, which means you're going to have to seek after it, desire, get filled up with the Holy Spirit, be ready to operate in it. Remember down here, it says in verse 31 that you may all prophesy one by one, and all may learn, and all may be comforted. God wants you to know that He wants you to seek after operating whatever gifts of the Spirit there might be. He may want to use you in word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, revelation gifts, or power gifts, healings, miraculous works, all these things that may manifest it in some way, gift of faith. These are all things that He wants to bring forth and we need to be seeking after these things. This is His desire for you and me. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. He also wants you to pray not only with your mind in line with the Word, but also in tongues. Every believer needs to pray in tongues. I've had people ask me, say, well, do I have to pray in tongues? Well, from a scriptural standpoint, yes. We're not talking for you to be saved, but you have, if you don't pray in tongues, you're not praying as you must. You're not praying effectively at all. Notice, he said, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. So how is my spirit praying? When I pray in unknown tongues. My mind, this is understanding, mean, is the word noose, which means mind. My mind is unfruitful. I don't know what I'm saying. Why would I want to pray something that I don't know what I'm saying? 
because it's not coming from your mind, it's coming from the one who knows everything, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, and you're speaking what the Holy Spirit will pray, and he knows everything, he knows exactly what needs to be prayed for. You're praying a perfect prayer directed by God, the Holy Spirit. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. And we already pointed out before, but we'll go back to this to show you why it is necessary for you to pray in tongues, not only because it says there to where to do it, but here in Romans 8, 26, likewise the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, helps our infirmities, and this speaks of the weaknesses, and what weaknesses could be, you have to look at the context to determine whether it's talking about weaknesses of body or weaknesses of mind. In this case, it's weaknesses of mind because it says, for we know not, well, that's talking about in our mind, we know not what we pray, might pray, again, meaning conditional, what we might pray for, as is necessary. It's necessary. And this is also the word that's translated must 58 times out of the 106 uses, as is necessary or as it must. Otherwise, how can you pray as you must or as necessary if you don't pray in tongues a lot putting the Holy Spirit in operation. If you're just praying according to what you know, then you're praying according to your level of knowledge, which is a drop in the bucket compared to God. <laughs> so how can you be playing, praying as you must or as necessary? You won't be. You need to pray in tongues and pray with your mind in line with the Word of God. That is important. Another thing that we see over in 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. It's all covenant relationship. God's come into you and he wants to accomplish everything in your life and he will do it. As you just do what he says, he'll accomplish it. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. And then he says, by which you are saved. Does that mean it's already been done? No by which you are being saved ongoingly, present tense. Passive voice means God's doing the action on the, on the person who is you and me, by which you are being saved by God. Well, does it mean automatically here? No, if, oh, there's a condition for this to be happening, for God to be accomplished, this are being saved in my life. If I am retaining, keep, is better, better understood, it's retaining what was preached unto you. Otherwise, this, what words, and there's the word for words here, here's the word logos, what, and this is the word for logos, which means what word, or the speech, which is be the word of God. That's why Young's brings it out, in what words I proclaim good news to you. That's if you're retaining it, if you're holding fast to it. Otherwise, you've got to be holding fast to it. You can't just be letting things slip. If you hold fast to something, that means, and ongoingly, because it's present tense, that means I'm holding it, I'm doing it, I'm keeping it, I'm guarding it, it's incorporated in my lifestyle, I'm not letting the enemy come and take it out because the devil wants to take the word out of your heart, remember. So that means you're a doer of it. <laughs> You've incorporated it into your lifestyle. You're holding fast. That means you are being saved if you're holding fast the word that's come to you. If you're not holding fast the word that's come to you, are you being saved? No. Because how is God working? Through the word. And why now must you hold fast? So that word will be working in you as you hear and do it, incorporated into your lifestyle. This is important to understand. These people that think that they're already say salvation's already established and that's it. No, this destroys it right there. You are being saved if you are holding fast what word that has been spoken unto you. We see another important thing for you to understand. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then cometh the end. And this is talking about the end when after Jesus has ruled and reigned for a thousand years. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Well, that's going to be at the end of the millennial reign because during the millennial reign, Jesus is ruling for a thousand years. 
and we're ruling uh, under him. So this is talking about the end. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. What does that mean? Well, there must be those who rise up against him during that time. And of course, we know at the end they will rise up against him. And if you and I are to be in a position of authority, ruling over cities or ruling over things, well, there must be a reason to rule. Why would you need to be ruling over things? You're keeping things in order. You're going to be ruling as kings because you have problems with people. Remember, who's going to be populating the, the, the earth after the, during the millennial age? The ones who didn't get killed in all the destruction. A few men were left and they start populating it throughout for the thousand years. And you and I, why would we be put over thor th cities unless we, we had to be ruling and reigning over somebody and keep them in order? That's right. See, you're training for reigning now. You got to learn. If you can't rule and reign in your own life, how are you going to be able to rule and reign in the life to come? If you've been have been faithful in the least, how can you be faithful in much? You won't be. <laughs> you won't be promoted. See, it's important what you're doing today. You got to learn to conquer and overcome and rule and reign in every situation in your life. And don't think at the end of your days that's all over. It doesn't matter. No, this is this is just the springboard for what's going to happen afterwards. You've got to realize that. That is important. For he must reign. Well, this is talking about Jesus. Ongoingly, till he put all enemies under his feet. Are there going to be some enemies that rise up? Yeah, there will be some enemies that rise up. You have to understand, Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be any enemies rise up or there's going to be reasons for is everything that's going to be great, no, no problems at all. No, he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. <laughs> and you and I are to rule and reign too. We're still dealing with all these people, remember, that have all been populating it, that uh, came through, that had never received Jesus and rejected him. And they're going to be deceived by the devil at the end to try to come against them all and attack them all. That shows you, you got to understand that you are training for reigning. If you can't rule now, why would you be in a position to rule later? You wouldn't be. It's of a necessity that you rule and reign in your life now. It's all about covenant. And you show yourself faithful. You, you do a little bit here, you know. You've been faithful a little bit. I'll give you authority over ten cities, you know. That's what God wants. How many people are going to be ready for that? If we don't rule and reign now, you won't be. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If any man love not or is not loving, here's one of these ifs. Oh, that means this is all the if part. After that's my responsibility. If any man is not loving ongoingly the Lord Jesus Christ, he is uh, 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 anathema, which means he's under a curse. He's accursed. He's accursed. <laughs> you're blessed if you're loving him, but if you're not loving him, covenant demands, you know, you're going to be cursed. Curses will come upon a person. You'll be, and also you'll be delivered over unto the wrath that's going to come if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. It is mandatory that you and I love him. And remember, if you love me, you keep his commandments. He that has his commandments and keeps them is he that loveth me. And if you love me, you keep my sayings. That's the guy who's loving him, doing what the word says. Then we come to, see, he brought a lot of things out to the Corinthians. In the second letter, he also said, hey, to this end did also did I write that I might know the proof of you. I want to. I'm going that I might know. Continue the. So that's conditional. The proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. Are we obedient in all things? We should be. Aren't we commanded to obey? Absolutely. Jesus is the Savior for who? All those who are obeying Him, eternal salvation. 
God wants you to be obedient. We're commanded to obey. And think about over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, where he says, or verse 12, that is, Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed. My oh boy, huh? that means I don't ever get off track. I'm always obeying. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. I mean, this is your lifestyle. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this is a command to you and me. Imperative mood, ongoing action, present tense, meaning as you've always obeyed, you are now to be working out continually your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's why we have the fear of God. And then it goes on, says, for it is God who is working and operating in you for what? When it says both here, To be willing, who's he talking about? He's talking about you and me to be willing, ongoingly, and to be doing, ongoingly, of his good pleasure. Otherwise, who's going to be willing, who's going to be doing the good pleasure? You and I are. Well, how are we going to get to that place? Because God's going to be working in you to bring you to that place of to be willing and to be doing of his good pleasure. And of course, how's God going to be working in you? Because of the Word. And when you're obeying, you're putting Him in operation for Him to be able to accomplish that. So you're going to, you're going to be willing and doing the, His good pleasure so He accomplishes everything in your life. And that's what He wants. God will do this work, remember. Remember, you can't do this yourself. It's God's work being accomplished in you. But you have to put Him in operation. This is all part of covenant relationship. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, here is where he said, whom, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also, for I forgave anything. To whom I forgave it, for sakes forgave it, the person of Christ. He says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. That tells us something. Satan could get an advantage of you if you don't do the word. Like in that case where he's talking about forgiving them. We can't be ignorant of his devices. He's trying to trip you up. He's trying to get you to give place to him. He's trying to get you off track so he can get to you. Remember, the thief cometh not that he might be able to steal, might be able to kill, might be able to destroy if conditions are met. And if he can get you off track of the Word of God, he's going to get to you. He's trying to get, trap you and deceive you away from the, from the way of the Word of God. Always do what is right in line with the Word. Know that when you don't, you just gave the devil advantage and he's going to come in. Remember, he's the accuser of the brethren that accuses us before God night and day. Of what? Of our sins. Certainly not our righteous walk. It's of our sins. It gives him a right legally. He understands how things operate according to legal, spiritual law. He's got a right to come after you and you can't even stop it. Remember, the blessings come on you and overtake you when you obey. But how about when you disobey? The curses will come on you and overtake you, and you can't even get away from them because the door is open, just like the destroyer of the serpents will come, if you know, you, like we saw already in 1 Corinthians 10, <coughs> if you don't walk in the ways of the Lord. Mandatory. Another thing that we see, the principle here in 2 Corinthians 2, 3, 16. Here it's talking about the veil that's on those of, over the Jews who rejected the gospel. It's upon their heart. Nevertheless, when they may turn to the Lord, might turn to the Lord, which means they'd receive Jesus, the veil be taken away. Well, that's, the same. that's, that's true for, really for anybody in a sense. Can they understand things until they get born from above? No. Can they perceive things? You can tell them all kinds of things, words, but can they perceive them and really have a, 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 a knowledge of it spiritually and be able to grasp hold of it? No, not until they get a brand new spirit. Because remember, the natural man receives not the things that are of the Spirit of God. They're all foolishness unto him. It's only the guy who, uh, who, can, who has born from above and he's got the Holy Spirit in him can receive those things that are freely given to him and get revelation of them. 
Therefore, that's why you lead someone to receive Jesus, then the veil will be taken away, and then, of course, then that you can start talking to them about all the promises. But they need to come to the Lord until these guys do, they aren't going to understand until they come to turn to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 tells us something else. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive, or this is the word komidzo, that he might <coughs> receive for himself, whether he likes it or not, <laughs> he's going to get it anyway, the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether good or bad. So that means we're going to be judged and we're going to be carrying off the things that we did that were good, but we're going to be judged and carry off the things that are bad. That's why, so what, have I got? what can I do about all the bad things? Well, you just don't do them anymore. <laughs> Today's the first day of the rest of your life. Get on track and make, make sure you're sowing all good things from now on. What's happened in the past has happened. Just make sure you've repented you have truly confessed your sin and turned away from it, and you're now correcting every problem in your life. You're a doer of the word. You're walking in line. Quit making mistakes of yield, yielding to sin and giving place to the flesh or the world, ways of the world because you don't want to be accumulating more bad rewards, negative rewards. But this is going to happen. You've got to understand that. When you understand that, you'll make sure I'm not going to be going doing anything contrary to the word any more. Verse 14. The love of Christ constrains us because we have judged that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That's right. And that he died for all, that they which live, which are the ones who are born from above, should not henceforth live unto themselves. Might not, subjunctive mood, continually live unto themselves. Could you live unto yourself if you want? Yeah. But you're not supposed to. And so you might not live unto yourselves, which is what you're supposed to do if you meet the conditions ongoingly, which means you've got to deny yourself. Remember, Jesus said the first thing, you deny yourself, you lose sight of yourself. And you're going to crucify the flesh daily. You're going to follow him. You're going to put the word first place. You're going to walk in spirit. You're going to walk in obedience to him. But who do we live unto? We live unto Him. We don't live unto ourselves. The I, 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 me, me, me mentality is going to take you down continually. You will go nowhere. You will see continual destruction. You must instead think what the Word says. You must live unto Him, not unto yourself. You do what He wants you to do. You deny yourself. Lose sight of yourself. That is important. This is all covenant. Well, how, why should that be? Well, you're bought with a price. You're a purchased possession. You're not your own any longer, right? So how can you live unto yourself? If you're not your own anymore and you live unto yourself, that's rebellion, isn't it, <laughs> against the one who purchased you? Well, how can I think I'm going to be blessed if I'm rebelling against the one who bought me? He belong, I belong to him. But if I live unto him, all the blessings that he has for me are going to come. He's going to bring forth everything that he purposes in our life. And that is what he wants for all of us. This brings us also to another important point. The false teaching says that people are perfectly righteous when they're born from above and that they think they're righteous forever because they have a righteous spirit. That is error. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him, this is talking about the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, mankind, who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus that we, mankind, might be made the righteous of God in Him? Does that mean we've already been made? No. We have to look at these words. Here's the first word, made. It is the word poeo, which means made. Well, if they translate it correctly, the next word made would be poeo, wouldn't it? But it's not. It is the word ginomai become. This is why we have to look up every word. It's imperative to find out if it's translated correctly, because the translations have tremendous error. So, that we might become, and when it says might become, that doesn't mean we already have become, because it's a subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement. We might become, and not just at a moment in time, 
when we got born from above. No, it's present tense, meaning ongoingly, <laughs> that we might become ongoingly the righteous of God. Well, that means if I got born from above and got a righteous spirit and now I'm walking in unrighteousness and sin, I guess uh, I didn't meet the conditions. That's right. It means you're not righteous unless you're walking in the ways of the word of righteousness continually. That is mandatory. Remember, 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. And why is he telling us not to be deceived? Because the subject that he's talking about knowing the false teaching <clears throat> ahead of time that would go forth, imperative mood, present tense, he's commanding you and I, do not let yourself ever be deceived, essentially. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Well, that means that's more than just getting born from above. That would be meeting the conditions of that present subjunctive might become ongoingly, may become ongoingly righteousness, the righteous one. And that's what it's talking about, you ongoingly being righteous. Remember verse 10, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Notice, people think the child of the devil is just someone who's not born from above. This doesn't say that at all. The children of God and the children of the devil, and then it tells you who is not of God whoever's not doing righteousness. Well, that means could you be born from above and not doing righteousness? Yes. Would you be a child of God? No. You'd be a child of the devil. Why? Because you're obeying unrighteousness, which makes you a child of the devil, regardless of whether you've got a brand new spirit or not. Meaning, how does God know us? He knows us by our fruit and by our works. That's why he says in Revelation 2 and 3, I've known your works, I've known your works, I've known your works. Well, that shows what kind of who you really are because that shows what you've been doing. Remember, the one who's doing the will of God enters into the kingdom. The ones who do the will of God are going to abide forever because they're the ones who are following after him. Therefore, you and I are going to do what he says. We come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Here in verse 3. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. This is what all ministries are supposed to be doing. You're not to give any offense or st stumbling or, you know, sinning in anything. We should always be doing what the Word says and always everything or being above a reproach on all things. That the ministry be not blamed or found fault with. Ministries should not have any fault found, found, fault find, found with them. Instead, they should be not having any offense whatsoever. So that means, that would be for me, and any ministry that you might be operating in as well, you can't, have, you can't be having any offense. Again, as I mentioned earlier, all these ministries that are having all these people getting fired and getting, you know, all kind of lawsuits coming against them and people suing them because of all their abuse and their sexual abuse and all the evil stuff. It's astounding. These things should have never, had ever happened. Give a black mark to the church as essentially through the world. It should have never happened. There should be no offense. And the, we always do what's right. We always do to teach what's right. We're always going to be obedient. We're going to do what's right. That's an imperative. We have to do those things. So the ministry is not blamed. We come to verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What does this mean? To come under an unequal or to be unequally yoked or to have fellowship with one who's not an equal. Well, who's going to be someone who's an equal? Someone who's walking, who's born from above and walking in line with the Word of God. We cannot be, have a, Fellowship with someone who's not an equal, well, that, that means we're not going to have fellowship with the people that are not believers. We're not going to have fellowship with those people that are walking contrary to the Word of God. We're not going to have these people. These are unbelievers or ones that are actually, with this word unbelievers, is apostos. 
pastos is the word that means faithful, not really believing. Otherwise, be not unequally yoked together with the unfaithful ones. Oh, well, that could be a believer or not a believer. Unbelievers, of course, are not faithful ones, but this is really talking about the unfaithful ones that aren't walking in line with the word. I'm not going to have fellowship with them. For what fellowship, and when you're having fellowship, you don't do it with the world, of course, but in the body of Christ, you have fellowship with everybody? Not necessarily. With the righteousness, the guy who's hearing and doing the word of righteousness, with the lawless one. Anemia means lawlessness. The one who's not following the law of Christ and being obedient to the word of God. What communion or fellowship has light with darkness? Darkness would be any time you have any kind of sin that comes into you. What agreement has Christ with anything that's worthless or wicked or anything that's of the devil? And what part has he that believeth, who's faithful, with one who is not faithful? Pastos and apostos. I'm not going to have anything to do with someone who's not faithful. Well, I'm going to be kind to them and, and cordial to them and, you know, I can talk to them and, fellow and minister to them and share the word with them, but that's not who I'm going to be in fellowship with. No way. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? None. You're the temple of the living God, as God said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and they shall, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That is what God wants. So what does he tell us to do? Notice what he says. Come out from among them, all those ones that were not right. Be separate, mark off from others by boundaries, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, anything that's not clean. Well, that means we stay away from anything that's not right with God. Now what happens? And I will receive you. Well, that means, is he going to receive, receive you if you are, you haven't set the boundaries, or you haven't, you've been touching the unclean thing, or you haven't come out from these things? No, he's not. And will be a father unto you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God will not manifest himself unto you, and you won't be as a son or a daughter. Remember the guy who doesn't come in line with the word, <clears throat> he's not going to be a son or a daughter. In fact, the one who won't receive correction, he's illegitimate, remember. He's not a son anymore. God knows you by what your walk is. And why would that be? Because you have a covenant with him. You came into covenant relationship. The word is the word of the covenant that you and I are to hear and do. And that's how God's going to know you, and that's how he's going to bring everything that he purposes upon into your life and accomplishes total work in you. It's great what he'll do. Why would we not obey him and do everything that he says? It's total rebellion. It cannot happen. We cannot allow this to happen in our life. Now, we saw then in chapter 7, verse 1, that we, 7 that is, verse 1, that having the promises were to cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That is our responsibility. So we perfect holiness in the fear of God. We also must have, as far as in dealing with all sin areas in our life, we need a godly sorrow that works repentance. He said, but I rejoice not that you were made sorrow, but you sorrowed to repentance. If we have a godly sorrow, it'll bring change of mind. You were made sorry after a godly man. Not, not sorry because of what they did to me or how this circumstance that came in that. It's a godly sorrow before God, see. A godly sorrow. You might receive damage by us in nothing. And what does that mean? How could you receive damage some, by some, someone who brought the word to you? If you got an attitude towards them and you damaged yourself because you got an attitude and didn't receive the correction that was coming to you. <laughs> I've seen people that way. And they got, they got actually hurt and wounded because they rejected the truth that came to them. They shouldn't have. He says, you are made sorry after a godly man that you might receive damage by us in nothing. They shouldn't have had any damage. They should, if they were receptive, they would have rejoiced at it. If they got mad and got an attitude at it, they damaged themselves because they got in sin. And they are going to be damaged. Don't ever get an attitude. Make sure, I mean, if it's something that's not right, then you address it and deal with it. 
but don't get an attitude on something when it's, if it's coming and maybe you haven't been so quick to repent. Godly sorrow works repentance, real repentance, change that's going to produce salvation. But the sorrow of the world works death. That, that's the guy that got caught on evil things and it's going to work death. He's, he's, he's not sorrow before God. He's sorry that he got caught. You know, Sorry that I suffered this problem. No, it's got to be a godly sorrow before him if you're going to see that you're going to be uh, come to the place of salvation from the Lord. We also see in chapter 8, verse 7, Therefore, as you abound in everything, you and I are to abound in everything. Everything that God says we're to be abounding in faith, in utterance, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, in your love to us. See that you abound in this grace also, which is the grace about giving, where they were proving the sincerity of their love. They were giving out and ministering to people's needs, helping them. Otherwise, you're to be abounding in everything that God has for you. So that's what he wants. See that you abound. Now, does that mean that you're gonna, everybody's going to abound? No, again, that's why it's the subjunctive mood, that you may be continually abounding if you meet the conditions because you're going to be hearing and doing everything that he says in all areas of your life. This brings us to another important thing. He was really dealing with the Corinthians on all kinds of stuff. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations or reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. How am I going to know that? Well, you've got to have to know what the Word says. You've got to have the knowledge of God. When you have the knowledge of God and something comes, and it's contrary or exalting itself in trying to get the ascendancy in your mind over what the Word says, so you'll submit to it and do it or think on it. Well, that's, that's the enemy coming at you or the flesh working at you. Anything trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, you cast it down. And you're to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's mandatory. Otherwise, the devil's going to work you through your mind. You've got to get the mind of Christ established in you as you get the Word in you, and then you have to still take the thoughts captive. You have the fleshly thoughts that come from the flesh and other things that the devil will try to bring at you. You've got to be ready to stay on top of any and all thoughts contrary to the Word. You bring them captive to the obedience of Christ by replacing them with the Word, thinking, what does the Word say? And you're to be ready, prepared and ready, have a readiness. Prepared and ready to revenge all disobedience, every disobedience. Because that's disobedient thoughts trying to take you down. When your obedience might be fulfilled, otherwise this is your part to carry this out. You have to fulfill your obedience by doing, it will be fulfilled when you obey God, of course, is going to work this in you because of you doing what he said, of casting down the imaginations, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And you also got to learn not to look on things on an outward appearance. You're going to get deceived left and right. He says, do you look on things after the outward appearance? <laughs> no wonder you're having problems. You're looking at them after the flesh, after the natural. You can only discern things after the spirit. And it's going to be, has to be in line with the Word of God and truly by the Holy Spirit. And, of course, you're not going to be just looking at things on the outward appearance. That is a mistake. Getting your mind established is also extremely important because the devil is trying to get you to corrupt your mind. 2 Corinthians 11.3, I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from simplicity is not the really the good translation. It really means singleness of mind, not simplicity. Your mind should be corrupted from the singleness of mind, which is what you're supposed to have, instead of a doubleness of mind, double-minded. You don't want to be double-minded. You want to be single-minded. Corrupted from that singleness of mind that's in Christ, that's a mind renewed to the Word that thinks on what the Word says, and it's always thinking right on what the Word says. So you've got to be ready. The, the serpent got to Eve. She didn't think on what the Word said. She, she got deceived. She started reasoning things in her mind, 
looking at the tree to make her wise, you know, and all these things. Oh, this is pleasant to the eyes. <laughs> Started yielding to things that were wrong. What a mistake. Instead of thinking on what she should have been thinking on, on the word. We see another thing over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Here we see several subjunctive moods in verse 7 and following. Talking about Paul in this, the thorn in the flesh. Important to understand this. Many people have taught and translations have shown forth that they think that this is talking about Paul exalting himself, getting a big head and being conceited. No, it's all a lie. Instead, it's the opposite. He was being already had hum been humble, be humble before God to get all these revelations and God was exalting him as he was humble. God was the, in the work of, humble, of exalting him. Look what it says, lest I not, should be exalted above measure. This is all one Greek word, which means it was conditional in subjunctive mood that I might be exalted above measure. The key to understand this is, was this Paul exalting himself above measure? How would you know? You look at the voice. If the voice is the active voice, he would be doing it. But if the voice is the passive voice, that means somebody else is exalting him. Who would that be? God. Why? Through the abundance of the revelations. Why? So that then all the people could hear the revelations that he was given so they get the truth, the revelation of the truth coming to them. People have not, why they haven't understood this is beyond me. And how translations could translate it you got to read them. There's, there's a lot of them out there. They're crazy. They're just, they talk about the guy being conceited and so forth. This is totally wrong. He's not exalting. It was, he was being exalted by God through the abundance of the revelations. Then what? There was given, and who'd this come from? A thorn in the flesh, the angel, angelos, of Satan. That's the devil, an evil spirit, after him to try to stop him from being exalted. That's what's going on. And notice it says to buffet me. That's not a good translation because this isn't saying like he could just come and buffet you because he was, Satan sent him and he's gonna be able to get you. No, I got the cursor over the word too. It's a word that means in order that. Otherwise it's conditional now. In order that he might be able to continually, ongoingly buffet me, present tense. Otherwise, could Paul stop him from buffeting him? Yeah. Did he understand that? No. He had to learn that, and he did. Lest I might be exalted above measure. Again, subjunctive mood, passive voice, by God, present tense. So what did Paul do? He didn't understand things yet. So. For this thing I sought, besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. He's wanting God to get this away from him. Did that do any good? No, not at all. Because was he going to get it away from him? No, Paul was given authority and he was supposed to resist the enemy and use his authority to conquer the enemy. So God said to him, my grace is not sufficient, meaning for you to put up with your situation and get pummeled by the devil. No. My grace is possessing of unfailing strength to defend and ward off the enemy for you. That's what it means. Otherwise, what's the favor of God? For God's blessing, right? Was his favor so you could just let the devil beat you up left and right? Is that the favor of God? How could that be the favor of God? Hey, I'm going to give favor to you. The devil's going to smite you can, and beat you up left and right everywhere you go, but that's okay. That's insane. <laughs> the favor of God is to give you unfailing strength to defend and ward off the enemy's attacks. You have that grace for you as well. For my power, not strength, dunamis, is perfected, made perfect, which it is, in your weakness. And where's your weakness? Flesh, weakness of the body. He was trying to handle it in the flesh. 
Most gladly, therefore, I'll rather glory in my weaknesses, same word, not infirmities, weaknesses of my body, in order that, otherwise I'm not moved by the weakness of my body, I'm not going to try to deal with this in the flesh. If you try to deal with things in the flesh, you always fail. You're not going to see any results. No, I don't, I, I, even though I have weaknesses, so what? It's not going to bother me. All that's important is get the power of Christ resting on me, which is going to manifest the power of God to conquer all these enemies. He'll give you the unfailing strength, the power to ward off and defend and conquer every enemy. You have authority over all the power of the enemy, and you are to use that authority to conquer them. And then he goes on and he makes a statement, Therefore I take pleasure in, firm, in weaknesses or reproaches or necessities or persecution, distresses. Oh, they don't bother me, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak in flesh, in fact, it's interesting, when I may be continually weak, have weakness, which, you know, we have continually weakness in flesh, then am I powerful, doing a toss. Otherwise, he's not moved by the flesh. Don't be moved by what you feel. Get the power of God in you and operate it in spirit with the power of God. You have authority. You're to use your authority and conquer all of the enemies and overcome everything that comes against you. Now, a couple of more scriptures we want to look at that are important here for today. Galatians 1.4 speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us. Think about it. He gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us. You know, wait a minute. You mean it wasn't a guaranteed thing that he'd deliver me? That's right. He had to meet the conditions to do all the things that were necessary to deliver me. And that's exactly what he did. He gave himself for our sins, and then what did he have to do? He had to go down to hell. He had to take back the keys of hell and death. He had to conquer the enemy. He had to do all the things and go up to heaven and so forth. And so he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God. Otherwise, Jesus had to meet the conditions to accomplish this, and he did. If Jesus had to meet conditions, you and I have to meet the conditions. That's for sure. Otherwise, don't think that, well, I mean, I've got to meet all these conditions. God didn't have to do anything. He just came down and just operated as God. No, he didn't. He had to do everything and meet every condition. Jesus did everything the Father told him to do, and he did nothing of himself. Look at this in Galatians 1, 8 and 9. This is another one that's important. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto him, let him be accursed. He is accursed. Meaning anybody preaching a so-called gospel that's contrary to the gospel, meaning false doctrine, things that are not truth, they're cursed. It doesn't matter who you are. You have to preach truth. If you preach anything contrary to the gospel, they're cursed. As I said, I say it again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than what you have received, which was the word of God, the truth, let him be accursed. He's cursed. Boy, that's something. Think of all these people that are teaching things that are contrary to the word. They're cursed. They may be nice people. They may have good intentions. But if they're not teaching things accurately, they're cursed. That's why anybody who preaches the Word, you have to make sure that you are studying and learning and looking everything up and making sure that you're bringing forth truth. And if you find out something you're just not, you got to have repentant shoes on immediately and get that thing in order. It's what I've done all my life, you know. Get, get rid of all those false teachings that I heard long ago and come in line with the Word of God by studying everything out. You have to come to that place. Otherwise, you're under a curse. Well, that means it's very important that everybody does what is right. 
He says, now do I persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? Yet if I please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. A lot of people don't preach the truth because they're men pleasers. You can't be a man pleaser. You got to be a God pleaser. You can't hold anything back. You got to be doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. Remember what it says, jump ahead to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. We were allowed of God to put, be put in trust with the gospel. He's trusted you. He's trusted me. He's trusted you with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. We can never be a man pleaser. That means you never compromise it. You can never sugarcoat it. You can never leave some things out. You can never, well, I'm not going to address this issue. No. You've got to bring it. You're, got a pleasing, you're pleasing God. Do you want to be promoted? Do you want to be found to be faithful? Do you want to be found one who he can trust and put in a position of authority in the life to come? Certainly, if you're pleasing men, no way in the world. You're going to be cast aside. Only those that are God-pleasers. And he is testing our heart to find out whether we're going to do what is right in his sight or not. Now this brings us to another point. False brethren. False teachers. We can't allow that. You can't allow that to come. And you've got to know who's false and who's not. And you've got to not give place to listening to those. Galatians 2.4 That because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. They wanted to bring them into bondage, back into the law. To whom we gave place by subjection, no. Now it says not for an hour. I, I can't believe they said, well, 60 minutes we're going to go along with it, then we're going to change it. No. This word can also mean not for a moment. You have to look at it in the context. You think he'd put up for, for an hour? He'd been put up for a second, you know, a moment. <laughs> no way are we going to submit to any of this stuff. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Otherwise, you be ready to deal with anything that comes. You got to guard yourself. I got to make sure, guard, guard the church. Might make sure things are right. Let me just say this. When we were in Ohio for the 28 years, Long ago, I used to bring in special speakers from all over the place. Every time I brought a special speaker in, almost, almost every single time, and Renee can attest to this, they brought things forth that were false and wrong. And I had to get up the next time and correct them, and I, I would. I wouldn't let it slide. I'd get up and say, look, I've got to sh share these things with you. This person came and said this and this and this and this. It's wrong. And here's why it's wrong, wrong, wrong. To correct it because I couldn't allow evil stuff to be sewn in. Amen. And after put, I said, seeing that happen for quite some time, so many, I said, no more. <laughs> I'm not going to have any false ones coming in. It's not because or having people come in just because I wouldn't want to have someone come in. I just couldn't find any of them that were right. I had some people come in and wanted to tell jokes. No way. <laughs> you know, be the jokey guy. I had the guy come in and give his opinions. All, all of a sudden, he's going along and then he gives off his opinions. Wait a minute. That's not in line with the word. That's contrary. Well, I had to do something about it. Many times I had to stand up and say, that's wrong. And I told him why and I pro proved it and showed him the scriptures and so forth. We have to get the truth. We have to guard ourselves. You've got to guard yourself. I'm responsible to guard the church. For, you know, bring th things got to come in that are right. That's for sure. Because we can't have the wrong things. We've got to have the truth. And another scripture we look at. Galatians 2.18. If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. That means anything that you destroyed in the past. Well, that was no good. I got rid of that. And you build it again? Well, I kind of went back into it again. <laughs> now you made yourself a lawbreaker. That's what this means, a transgressor, a lawbreaker. You're in trouble. You can never go backwards and allow something that you got rid of to come back into your life. No way. You got rid of it, it should be rid of it out of your life forever. 
never build again the things that have been destroyed. In this case, of course, he was talking about going back into law, Old Testament. But no, he got rid of all that. He wasn't about to go back there and make him a lawbreaker. And then we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5. You have to understand your flesh. And the voice of the flesh is your feelings. And any desires that come to you from the mind or your emotions that is not in line with the Word of God is coming from the flesh. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk, and this is a command to you and me. Ongoingly, present tense, in spirit. There's no the. This is the word walk, and that's the word spirit. There's no definite article. Walk, be walking in spirit. And it's not a capital. This is not talking about the Holy Spirit. The capital letter was put in by the translator thinking he's helping the translation. No. In fact, all the, if you look in the Greek, when all the ones, they were all in capital letters. <laughs> so how are you going to know? You have to know by what it's, what it's talking about. Walk in spirit according to the word, his words are spirit and life. And you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That means the lust of the flesh will try to be coming at you and you've got to always be on top of it. You've got to walk in spirit. And that's good. And you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh as long as you also, meaning you have to meet the conditions, you're going to have to crucify that flesh daily. You're going to have to be ready to take every thought captive and not give place to anything that's coming into you that's trying to get you to yield to the flesh. Remember, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary, adverse, opposed to one another. Well, we can't allow that to happen. God wants you to make sure that you are walking in order. Verse 25, if there's an if. We live in spirit, and actually this can mean also since. And in this case, it really does imply that because it's not, notice Young's made it may live, making you think it's a subjunctive. I'll put the cursor over the word live. It is not subjunctive mood. He shouldn't have made that. It was a mistake. It's simply a present tense. So it's really saying since we are living in spirit, making a straight statement not a conditional statement. Since we are living in spirit, then he's saying you might continually, may continually be walking in spirit. Are you living in spirit? Do you live in spirit? Yeah, because you've got a brand new spirit. Does that mean you're going to be walking in spirit? <laughs> Only if you meet the conditions. How do I do that? By walking in the Word. Because the Word is spirit in life. Jesus' words. Ongoingly, you're to walk continually in spirit. That is what he expects for every single one of us. God wants you to understand these are all conditions. These are all the promises that will come to pass in our life as we see if we meet the conditions. But if we don't, then we'll see the negative things happen. Of course, like in this case, where if you walk in the flesh, the works of the flesh, you can't have those. Those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're born from above, but you have works of the flesh. You don't inherit the kingdom. You, we cannot allow that. We're only going to operate in spirit. We're only going to do the word. God is doing this great work in you as you hear and do the word. You're getting the mind of Christ established in you. You are denying yourself. You're making sure that you're taking every thought captive. All these things are important. And you understand, you do your part, God will do his part. And we saw a lot of cases here where you've got to watch about false brethren. You've got to watch about people, false, false doctrines coming in and teaching you. Someone coming in and trying to, you know, make money off you, preaching gospel. Give me some money and I'll, you know, and I'll preach the gospel to you. These kind of crazy things. It's gone on in the body of Christ. It's terrible. Make sure, guard yourself. You've got to guard yourself, especially from what you see out there on the internet, on these t things, people that think that they're, uh, uh, all kinds of teachings are out there that are way off, that are not in line with the Word of God. You've got to really check things out and guard a lot of things that are really flaky and off the wall that are not right. Make sure you're being wise so you don't get deceived. Remember, we have to guard ourselves 
so we're not deceived. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of covenant conditions and covenant promises. I understand all these subjunctive mood verbs and if statements are the conditions that I must carry out. When I do that, I know what God will do. He will perform His part of the covenant and bring those promises to pass. I know all the promises of our, our yea and in Him, amen. And I am to partake of all these promises, to become a partaker of the divine nature and to become like Jesus and like the Father. And no promise is to be left me of entering into his rest. I will possess them all as I hear and do the word. I will meet all the conditions and God will accomplish his work in my life. And as we've seen today, I must rule and reign because if I don't rule and reign over my enemies, I will not be in the kingdom, in the millennial reign. I thank you that I will be a hearer and a doer of all that I've heard this day. And I will see your work accomplished in my life. Thank you for performing it. I know you'll do it. The promises will come to pass because I'm meeting every condition because I'm a hearer and a doer of the word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Father, thank you for all that you brought forth this day. Thank you for the revelation of the truth. Thank you that we're understanding covenant. We're understanding spiritual law. We're understanding you're a performer and you do not have respect to persons. You do exactly what you say. Thank you that we are meeting all conditions and seeing all the promises come to pass because we're hearers and doers of this word. Thank you for covenant relationship so we can know exactly what you'll do in every situation. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. See, that's the great thing about covenant.